Welcome to the Caravan Podcast, a venture of the Herbert and Jane Dwight Working Group on the Middle East and the Islamic World at the Hoover Institution. The Working Group publishes research and commentary on the Middle East with questions for U.S. policy, and you can find our work at www.hoover.org slash caravan. I'm Cole Bunzel, a fellow at Hoover and member of the Working Group, as well as the host of this podcast. We have been on hiatus for a year or so, but I'm pleased to announce that the podcast is back and we will be bringing you regular episodes featuring discussions with leading scholars and policymakers on issues related to the politics of the greater Middle East. One of these hot-button issues right now, of course, concerns Saudi Arabia, led by the 38-year-old Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, or MBS, and his apparent interest in normalizing relations with Israel. Last month, the Crown Prince, in an interview with Fox News' Brett Baer, confirmed that negotiations over normalization were ongoing, saying that, quote, every day we get closer, and calling the prospective deal, quote, the biggest historical deal since the end of the Cold War. Likewise, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said last month at the UN General Assembly that, quote, we are at the cusp of a historic peace. Someone who has been following these negotiations very closely is my friend Joshua Teitelbaum, who is our guest today. Josh is a professor of modern Middle East history at Bar Ilan University in Israel and a specialist in the history of Saudi Arabia. His forthcoming book examines the politics of the royal family and in particular the role of the Saudi National Guard. Josh is also, I'm pleased to say, a soon-to-be visiting fellow at Hoover. He recently wrote an essay for our working group, which I recommend, titled U.S.-Saudi Relations in Crisis, History's Lessons, in which he discussed the issue of Saudi-Israeli normalization, among other things. Josh, delighted to have you on the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on. So, in many ways, you're sort of the ideal person to be offering insights into the prospects of U.S. brokered uh, Israel-Saudi normalization. You are you sort of check all three boxes, as it were. You are an American. You're actually born right here uh, in the area uh, under Hoover Tower. Uh, you are an Israeli, and you have spent most of your academic career studying Saudi Arabia. So this must be a quite exciting time uh, for you on many levels. Did you ever expect that such that we might actually be talking about this kind of a deal seriously? Um, I I have I, I did I did expect it um, because it's just been cooking for so long, and and I think we'll discuss what are the likelihoods involved. But I just want to start with two caveats, okay? First, everybody sure. everybody watching this thing, um, particularly in the age of, of the internet. We have to be uh, aware and pay attention to the buzz, okay? The buzz is created. It's created by three sides that have an interest in pushing this thing, and they're all leaking to journalists to make things seem further along than they actually are, okay? And uh, to raise okay. expectations, particularly the Israeli side, okay? The second caveat is I'm a historian. I'm at my best in the past, and I can extrapolate from the past to try, try to analyze the present. But as for the future, I try to bear in mind that the Talmud says that the, since the destruction of the Second Temple in, by Rome in 70 AD, uh, prophecy is the province of fools. Uh, yeah, so those are things. Now I'll, I'll get closer to, to, to your, you know, answering your question. So few historians who actually have read the thousands of documents available in, in archives should be surprised at, at this development. We, we might even ask, why did it take so long? And the reason is this. Even though the Saudi leadership, particularly the founder, Ibn Saud, and his son, King Faisal, were deeply anti-Semitic, King Faisal famously used to hand out copies of the uh, the, the uh, SARS forgery protocols. The pro protocols, the elders of Zion, mm -hmm. and the US, dip U.S. diplomats were always complaining about this. Once the Palestinian leadership took a radical turn with the establishment of the PLO in 1964, the Palestinian movement itself became a threat to the regime and to the royal family. We we'll always need to remember we're talking about Saudi Arabia. It's a country named after a family. Saudi is the royal family. Palestinian 
people involved with the Palestinian movement placed bombs in Saudi Arabia in the 60s and, and 70s, and they identified with the Soviet side in the Cold War and received support from the Soviet Union. The Palestinian leadership essentially blackmailed the Saudi uh, leadership into giving it millions of, of dollars. So the Saudis really wanted to settle the Palestinian issue for this reason. And for many years now, they haven't been shy about expressing their disgust with the Palestinian leadership at their squandering of opportunities for peace with Israel. So the Saudis, like Sadat at that time, they want out. And it's not so well known that behind the scenes, actually, in the, uh, after the Camp David acc Accords were signed with, with uh, Egypt, they tried to get the Arabs to support the Camp David agreements. And they supported Sadat financially. And, you know, I could go on and on, but, but I'll stop here. But there's actually a clandestine relation be relationship between Israel and Saudi Arabia that goes back to the 1960s, particularly regarding Yemen. That's so, very interesting. I don't think a lot of people are, are aware just how, how much of a kind of relationship has been um, kind of has, has existed for, for decades, yeah. um, which is something that you refer to in, in your, your recent essay for us uh, in the caravan. Another thing that you, you brought up um, kind of repeatedly in this article was what you, what you style or what you call, and I quote, you hear Saudi Arabia's historically pervasive sense of insecurity. And that's sort of the, the historical context in which you, you frame this, this issue. What do you mean by its pervasive sense of insecurity? And okay. Why is that important? Okay. So uh, um, Americans, I would think rightly, might be surprised at this, that, that I would write that, their pervasive sense of insecurity, since, you know, the U.S. led a massive intervention in 1991 after Saddam Hussein captured Kuwait and positioned his troops on the Saudi border. Um, but again, careful historians know that for years the Saudi royal family were scared to death of their own army, and they created a separate militia, the Saudi Arabian National Guard, to balance, balance it. There wasn't a, 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 a half a year that went by in the 60s and 70s without uncovering some Nasserist or sympathetic or left-wing sympathetic uh, coup or organization planning within the Saudi army. Um, and the U.S. was always hesitant, with good reason, about providing arms and security guarantees for, for this regime. Uh, in the 1960s, it, it still had slavery. Okay, but with the Cold War, right? Yeah, with, with the Cold War, the economic boom caused by the rise in oil prices after '73, the U.S. became a lot more interested. Huge arms deals, about 140 billion dollars so far, these supported the U.S. defense industry. That meant, of course, assembly, more assembly line jobs, but it also meant lucrative post-government or between administration jobs with these companies or consulting for the Saudis. This is known in Washington as the revolving door. And uh, MBS uh, knew this. He recently knows this. He recently signed a, a, uh, a, a huge deal with Boeing to buy, uh, he's establishing a new airline, to buy, I think, about 50 Dreamliners or so. And this was spun by the Biden administration as a, a great boost to uh, American industry and particularly providing jobs for people without a college education. We know, we know the whole issue of loan, you know, the student loans and how that's such a burden for so many people. And so here the Saudis were, were helping uh, this out. But all this support, what the U.S. did in 91 and everything, has never really been enough for the Saudis. They feel insecure. They're arrestive minorities in Saudi Arabia. Um, there was the drone attack by Iran in 2019 where the U.S. Uh, on, on, um, on oil installations in Saudi Arabia where the U.S. didn't respond. So they're seeking something more ironclad because despite all the money, the weapons, and the training, the, the fact is that Riyadh cannot defend itself. So I guess the, the issue that comes up here for me is that if... If Saudi Arabia's sense of insecurity is sort of a historical constant, then something must have changed that has brought uh, brought the country to the point of wanting to kind of make this um, relationship with Israel official, 
or normal. So what is that? Is it MBS? Is it the threat of Iran? Is it all of these things combined? So, uh, you know, he's think? linked. MBS has, has linked, and we can go into that maybe a, a little bit later as well and expand, linked normalization with Israel with all these security things that I'm sure we'll get into with the United States. And so, so this sense of security is is historic. It's, it's been there for, in, insecurity has been there for a long time. But what's changed now is the Iran, the Iranian threat, which despite, you know, this is very important, despite uh, renewed relations and the, the hyped uh, uh, um, uh, Chinese mediation and so forth, there's still the basic animosity there. There are two hegemons who are rivals for power in the region. Okay, there's the Shiite minority in Saudi Arabia. There's the U.S., you know, pivot to Asia that, that is always talked about. Okay, how, how interested is the U.S. really in the Middle East? Maybe it's not so important anymore, the Saudi thing. Maybe, you know, the U.S. is producing most of its own oil. Um, there was the failure, basically a failed policy in Yemen. I mean, they tried to do something in Yemen, they were unsuccessful. The U.S. eventually, you know, was not, was not entirely on board. Um, so they want the U.S. to stick around, and this is their way of doing it. They're trying to kind of leverage Israel and the relationship with the United States and, and, and China into getting the to, U.S. to commit to something. Okay, so let's get down to the, the mooted terms of a normalization agreement between Saudi and Israel, as these terms have been reported in the press. The most interesting thing about all this talk, as you note in your, your essay for Hoover, is that uh, it centers on Saudi-U.S. relations. Three out of the four points or terms that they've been reported are Saudi demands from the U.S. So among these four, we have uh, first, some kind of security guarantee for Saudi Arabia from the United States, uh, kind of related to that, accelerated acquisition of the most sophisticated U.S. weaponry, which is often held up in Congress, uh, U.S. support for a civilian nuclear program, nuclear, nuclear enrichment program, uh, and fourth, this is the, only the fourth point involves some kind of Israeli concession to the Palestinians. Everything else has to do with the U.S. Uh, and and Saudi Arabia. So, first of all, do you agree with the, that brief summary that I just laid out there? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do. Um, I'll just put one caveat again here again as we start to discuss that, you know, like so many things, that the devil is in the details, and we don't know the details, okay? And th there are That's a true. huge amount of moving parts that would have to come together to make this work. It's kind of like a a Rubik's Cube on steroids. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there certainly are. I think another thing I should have mentioned here is that, you know, something that the United States seems to be uh, trying to get out of this deal is limitations on Saudi, kind of newfound Saudi uh, relationship with the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And that also applies to the Emir Emiratis. So it seems like uh, at least in one interpretation of the Biden administration's uh, motives is some kind of uh, of effort to to limit that relationship with with China, as you as you wrote in your essay, uh, um, the the Biden right. administration is concerned about this, and the Saudis are saying, if you can pivot to Asia, we can pivot to Asia too. Right, and, and the U.S. is. I, I think the the Biden administration woke up here, maybe a little bit late, but they woke up here, and they're you know the, there's this uh, a transportation system that they've proposed from India all the way through Saudi Arabia to Israel. Uh, you know, through Europe and so forth, which kind of is kind of reminds one of uh, what are they calling it these days? The One Belt, One Road, uh, Chinese. Uh, right. It's, uh, it's kind of kind of echoes that. Um, but you know, I suppose better late than never. Yeah, I mean, it really. I mean, things move so quickly these days. Uh, it's hard to uh, even remember that Biden, President Biden, or before he was President Biden on the campaign trail, he called Saudi Arabia a pariah and said he would treat it as such. Um, mm -hmm. And then the the administration was very reluctant to even ish, utter the words Abraham Accords, the name for the normalization agreements between Israel and uh, the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, Sudan from, from 2020, uh, brokered by the Trump administration. So uh, now it's just a kind of um, complete reversal. Um, but in any event, um, we'll, we'll allow for that. Uh, let's get down into some of these, uh, the terms. The, the first, the, which 
to me seem, I mean, I guess I think all of these are quite difficult, um, even on their own, altogether become even more difficult to kind of get over the finish line. But this idea of a security guarantee, um, it, first of all, there, there are many forms which it could take. Uh, there is the idea of a, an Article 5 NATO sort of binding agreement that would bind the United States to come to the defense of Saudi Arabia if it were attacked. There is something, uh, another idea that I've seen reported is the idea of uh, the kind of agreement that the U.S. has with Japan and South Korea, which is you know, a little bit less, um, it might be a bit more ambiguous. Um, but you've seen, I've just saw yesterday that 20 Democratic senators issued a joint letter to President Biden. And this included uh, Chris Murphy, Elizabeth Warren, and Bernie Sanders, uh, kind of calling into question this entire idea of a security agreement, uh, writing, and I quote here, uh, that a um, high degree of proof would be required to show that a binding defense treaty with Saudi Arabia aligns with U.S. interests. So how do you look at this issue? Do you, do you think that... Um, you know, there's one form of a security agreement that makes more sense, that's more likely, and, and how, you know, difficult would, will this be able to achieve? Sure. So, so this is, th this is hugely difficult. And again, the, the devils are in the de details. There, there are several types of, of security agreements that the United States has. Uh, I guess the strongest one is Article Five in NATO, but but even there, there's there's some wiggle room. Um, there's something called major non-NATO ally sta status, um, which Israel ha has, Egypt has, Colombia. There are about, I think, 18 countries that have that. Um, and this makes these countries eligible for, uh, for defense agreements, but doesn't mandate them. The same, it makes them eligible for accelerated, accelerated arms supplies, um, but there's no security commitment. Um, and it's more a statement of intent, intent. I think the Saudis are looking for more than that, um, perhaps closer to what uh, the U.S. actually has with Japan, where their commit is, the United States commits to come to Japan's defense. Again, the language is vague there, uh, or like with South Korea, right. where, the, where the language is even stronger. Um, you know, but still, even with these agreements with Japan and South Korea, the, the proof, of course, is in the pudding and in the, the political circumstances at the time of the event. Um, of course, NATO itself has a huge common defense apparatus, which the U.S. is unlikely to do anything like that with Saudi Arabia. So, so what are these senators, this important letter, I think, that uh, you rightly point out, um, these are leading Democratic senators, <clears throat> And they're pushing back against this idea of a U.S. security guarantee, um, and is question they would have to vote for, right? It, I, I think absolutely, that's absolutely, they'd have to vote for it. So you're 100 percent right. I mean, that's what makes what they say so important. So, um, so they're questioning: Does it align with U.S. interests? And, and the political challenge here is is huge for the administration. Um, Japan and South Korea are robust democracies. And th in this respect, they share important values with America. The Senate would have to ratify a treaty that, that commits the U.S. in such a, 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 a fashion. These senators are, are all Democrats. Uh, they support the administration, but they question whether American troops should be committed to defend a regime with such a dismal human rights record, including the murder of a columnist for the Washington Post, Jamal Khashoggi, um, while Saudi Arabia is, is famously and well-publicized, liberalizing socially and economically, uh, political oppression has gotten even worse. Now, let me just say, the U.S. has relations with a lot of repressive regimes, okay, but it doesn't have defense treaties, as far as I know, with, with any of them. And so this is a huge ask from the United, from the United States, um, which might ask why it should be asked to pay the price to formalize relations between two countries that are moving uh, t towards each other anyway. I'll just add one more thing here. It, it's important to note that, that uh, Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, had good advice when he l linked U.S. security guarantees to peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia. That would be a huge achievement, that piece, for any administration. 
But the, the senators are cautioning against this link this linkage. That's kind of the other part of the letter. If it doesn't significantly significantly advance a solution to the Palestinian issue. And they caution against a simply symbolic move on the part of Israel. They're saying that's not worth a security commitment to a non-democratic country like Saudi Arabia. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get to the, the Palestinian component of this um, in a bit. Sure. It's just it, one thing I, I think it, you know, that does make it perhaps m- more uh, feasible for such an agreement to, to get passed in the Senate um, under the Biden administration is the fact that he is a Democratic president and he would have to bring along uh, presumably at least uh, 10, 15 Democratic votes in order to get this over the line. So, um, I mean, this is one of the issues. Is, uh, is MBS really interested in getting, you know, giving this win to the Biden administration? I've seen a lot of uh, doubts out there about that. Do you think that he has any kind of, um, you know, still grievances uh, against Biden for his calling him a pariah and, and would kind of, is just using this for, for propaganda? I think it's I think it's deeper than that. You know, I think uh, he sees, you know, kind of an opportunity to do, a, I don't know what to call it, a trifecta here. You know, Biden is running for re-election. He's, I, I, I think if something could get done, uh, he would go for it. I think he would bore more, I think he would be more comfortable, as he was previously, with the Trump administration. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see how that, uh, that ends up. But, uh, but I think, you know, if it could work, he, he, he would go for it. Great. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Yeah. Uh, let's get to the sort of the second part of this, uh, this mooted agreement, which, which concerns the idea of U.S. support for Saudi um, nuclear, domestic nuclear enrichment program. And I'm, I won't pretend to be an arms control expert or an expert on nuclear proliferation, but one thing I, I, I want to ask you is, um, from the Israeli perspective, I've noticed that there's been some resistance to this idea. Um, sure. So what, what's the mood, and how, how does Netanyahu kind of talk about this in public, and w- would the Israeli security establishment you know, really be kind of comfortable with this? Okay, so it's, it's a great question. I'm not a nuclear expert either. Um, but I'm somewhat of an expert on Saudi Arabia, and the Saudi Ra- Saudis want to be a regional and world power, even a world power. They have amazing aspirations, okay? You know, nukes go with that. Um, Iran is a nuclear threshold state. There's an issue of prestige here. And the Saudis want full control over the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, the domestic nuclear fuel cycle, and um, they say that they've discovered their own uranium, that they've mined their own uranium as well. And, you know, and so why should they have less than Iran is how they look, they look at it. But he's, MBS has said more than once that if Iran gets a bomb, Saudi Arabia will, will go for one as well. Again, the, the devil's in the details. Again, okay. And from the Israeli side, mostly Ron Dermer, the uh, head of the uh, Israeli Security Council, um, uh, has... A, kind of soft pedaled and say there's a way to work around this. So from the, the from the government you're kind of they're, they're not using this to quash any hopes, but mm-hmm. people in the security establishment who are talking off the record or, you know, ex security establishment people who can talk on the record, who are in essence still a part of the security establishment. We're talking about this same people more or less. Um they, they, they are really cautioning against this. Uh, why, why should Saudi Arabia be allowed uh, to have this? I mean, it's, it's, it's too big an ask. It's, uh, uh, there are issues we could discuss later about Saudi stability and, and so forth. Um, so, so from the Israel perspective, and I've heard some very respected American experts come out uh, against this issue of... Uh, letting them have full control over their nuclear fuel cycle. Yeah, one thing I should mention here is that I've seen a lot of uh, reporting about how Saudi Arabia is so interested in this, they're going to pursue it regardless of whether the U.S. is willing to cooperate with them or not. And if, if the U.S. is not interested in helping them develop this program, that they're 
you know, they're perfectly comfortable going to the Chinese or some other country. Uh, do you think that's a real, a real kind of threat? That I, uh, you know, that I might do. Make it I, more, I mean, it kind of does incentivize the U.S. If there's someone is going to be there, why not it be the United um, States? Yeah, to, it to does. It does incentivize. Right? You're, you're right. You're right. I think they are serious. I think they're they're serious about advancing their nuclear program, and and they'll they'll go other places. And we know there are countries in the world who are willing to help, even you know, even in the illegal side of this. So um, I think it's very important. You know, there's we, we have. This we have no you know kind of real proof of this, but there's been a long, kind of, uh, a long uh, held belief that there is some kind of arrangement with Pakistan for a nuclear weapon. This hasn't mm-hmm. been talked about lately, but I'm sure you you remember that. So maybe that's a certain uh, a certain option. But yeah, I know I think the you know the U.S. has to take this this seriously, and and it's not a it's not an easy an easy thing for U.S. policymakers uh, to decide. Israel, on the other hand, is is not going going to do going to give its nod to this unless it's something way out of the box that I really can't conceive of uh, right now. All right, let's get to the the next plank of the platform here, which is uh, the Palestinian issue. And um, you've written in the past about something called the Arab Peace Initiative. Um, which I'll ask you to explain in a minute. But one thing I've noticed, and then that agreement sort of entailed um, the uh, the creation of a Palestinian state in exchange for Arab normalization with Israel. And, but what's what MBS and what Netanyahu seem to be kind of gesturing at here is something quite uh, less than that, um, less substantial for the Palestinians. And MBS, in his interview with Fox News uh, the other week, said that he was looking to improve, he, while the Palestinian issue was important to him, where the, he said he didn't say use the term Palestinian state. He said we're looking to improve the lives of the Palestinians. So what do you think, what do you think is going on here with the, the Palestinian issue? How important is it uh, in, as part of this, okay. this deal? So it's a great question. Okay, so you know, there, there are two levels of Saudi discourse. The Arab Peace Initiative was, you know, very, kind of very prestigious thing, um, 2002, if I have the year correctly, even though I wrote about it. Um, uh, and uh, it was approved by all the Arab states, including, uh, including the Islamic Conference, where Iran voted in, in favor of it as well. Um, and it was considered an, an achievement. It did involve recognition of, recognition of Israel. And, and in Israel, there was even... A, debate, you know, should Israel, of course they can't accept the, the letter of it, but should Israel react more positively to it, at least, you know, in terms of the music. Um, and there were some half-hearted attempts at that, but this, of course, is a huge uh, departure from the Arab Peace, in, peace Initiative. But the, the two, if, if you listen to the foreign minister or the recently appointed ambassador to the Palestinian Authority, it's as if the Arab Peace Initiative is still policy, uh, and they're both speaking in Arabic, uh, as if that's you know mm-hmm. still Saudi policy. But as you've mentioned, if you listen to um, to uh, uh, to uh, the Crown oh, yeah. Prince, to Mohammed bin Salman himself, uh, I don't know. The, I don't think Brent Barry even actually asked him about the Arab Peace Initiative. But he's his bar is much lower. Okay, I mean he's. Um, because if, uh, it's like he's signaling that he's uh, his bar. He's just looking to improve their living conditions. Okay, and this has this has few political implications, and, and it's a lot of wiggle room here. You know, I mean, what is it? Giving more work permits, um, all, all kinds of things, right. and and so so if we were just dealing with a straight Israel. Saudi agreement not involving the U.S., um, then the sides are lo- would be looking for some kind of gesture, some kind of symbolic uh, face-saving um, measure. And I think that's, that's where they're going. Even Ramallah is signaling that for the right amount of Saudi cash, they, they might swallow normalization. But as we see from the letter of the senators, um, this still falls short. It's not worth the U.S. commitment. Again, there are a lot of moving parts here that, that have to right. somehow move together. And, and, and as I'll say, probably maybe towards the end, this, this puts me in a doubtful 
frame of mind about in an, an entire mm-hmm. deal. But but let's continue. Yeah, so, I mean, this morning I was listening to an interview with Mustafa Barghouti on Al Jazeera. He's a, a Palestinian uh, politician, and he was talking about this. And he said that in his discussions with Saudi officials who are, are visiting Ramallah, that they are still adhering to the letter of the Arab Peace Initiative, that this is the, you know, their framework for normalization. Um, and then the, the issue of what MBS said in the interview about improving lives came up, and he said, no, that would be unacceptable. Um, that would be like improving the lives of the inmates in, in a prison. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the other issue is, you know, yeah, sure, Mah- Mahmoud Abbas might say, yeah, for the right amount of cash, we'll, we'll sign off on this. But the, the broader Palestinian reception, you know, could, be, uh, could it be like an intifada? I mean, could there be something like this? I'm not so sure about an intifada, but you're, you're, really, you're really right to point this up. Mahmoud Abbas is not in good health. I think he's 87, 88, he's around there. There's no clear successor to him even even the even the um the people who are mooted as successors are considered so corrupt by by most of the the, the palestinian population um that you know they're they're weak so if if they give their assent to something that you know is just face saving that 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 w- can cause issues against the Palestinian Authority itself. Again, another one of these moving parts that is just so hard right. to, to make everything work. And perhaps uh, you know, the greatest obstacle is the current makeup of the, the Israeli government, which I know is uh, an issue you're, you're quite concerned with, and it's often reported that this is the most right-wing government in Israel's history. I don't know if that characterization is entirely accurate, but I certainly uh, am aware at, of the annexationist kind of um, ideology uh, behind several of the cabinet ministers, including Ben Gavir and Smotrich. I've read this Smotrich plan, which is all about kind of paying the Palestinians to leave the West Bank. Uh, these these cabinet ministers have said that they will not agree to any kind of uh, significant Palestinian concession uh, that limits uh, settlement activity. So, I mean, how how does I mean, it's kind of ironic that we're talking about normalization in the context of of this this government. How big of an obstacle do you think so it is? It's it's a huge obstacle. Um, uh, th- this this current constellation of of the government, which you did characterize correctly as the most right wing government in Israeli history, uh, even though you know it's it's only sixty four. You know it's it's not a huge majority, but it is a you know legitimately elected and constituted government. Um, the, the point is this, that it, it would be very hard to make even the smallest concession. Again, again, what, what, what kind of concession are we talking about? Is it a simple face-saving measure? measure? Maybe, that would, that would go, maybe that would go through, work permits, something like that. Certainly nothing that uh, moves towards a two-state solution. Certainly nothing that involves a halt to settlements or, or um, uh, you know, making a, a stronger border or, or a, what we call a two-state reality. But there's another very important point that is, I think, often ignored in, in analyses of, of how this government would deal with the possibility of a, of a, a, P, a full normalization. And that's that uh, we're in the midst in Israel of a massive, the, 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 the largest and most sustained political movement in the country's history. Full disclosure, I'm involved and, I'm, and I uh, support uh, the, uh, the movement uh, to um, maintain the independence of uh, the judiciary in, in, in Israel. And while I am, I am sure that everyone in this, this huge movement, I mean, we're talking uh, eight months, every Saturday night, and sometimes during the week, hundreds of thousands of people are, are in the streets, okay? Um, so why we all, I mean, who, what Israeli wouldn't support Saudi-Israeli normalization, um, the movement will not let such an agreement uh, become for Netanyahu a kind of get out of jail free card, and you know he has his own legal challenges. Okay, and permit Netanyahu to carry out what we consider a kind of coup against 
an in, the independent judiciary. What we need is a constitution. So, and, and here's the thing. If he tries to uh, re, revamp his coalition to make it a bit more favorable, in other words, kick out the far right folks and bring in the more centrist folk, we're talking about Benny Gantz's party, and you know, former chief of staff Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid's party. Um, if he's thinking about doing this, basically, um, these politicians would le- lose all support of of the um, of this movement, which is their basis of support now. Okay, they're the politicians who are leading the movement to maintain an independent judiciary. So, in fact, the leaders of this movement are calling, funnily enough. Uh, this whole thing, peace washing, okay? In other, okay, you get in. In other words, they support, yeah. Okay, they support it, but 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 not at the expense of this, you know, existential uh, battle. What we need is a constitution, and and so that's. But Josh, the point. Let, yeah. me, let me let me let me back up okay. because uh, I mean I don't I'm not a close close observer of Israeli politics, but from what I read. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is not, you know, wedded to the idea of judicial reform. That's not his kind of pet project. It's that's more uh, an issue of the coalition, um, the far right ministers. His legacy, if he were able to achieve his normalization with with uh, Saudi Arabia, would would be cemented. That must be a greater priority for him than judicial reform. And if if wouldn't he prefer kind of uh, being able to kind of change up the cabinet, uh, get Benny Gantz in there, put his legal troubles behind him, uh, get rid of the issue of, of judicial reform and, and, and push ahead with, with normalization sort of instead? Or, or is that just, am I misreading no, you, you, you have you have an important point. I mean, he, he is overseeing this whole thing, okay? He is really, he, he is the person behind this entire thing. It could not have happen without him. It also has to do with his own legal troubles. He, he himself has delegitimized the judiciary ever since he's, you know, he's been on trial and undermined the judiciary. You know, this kind of talk, we're, we hear in the United States too about, you know, the elites controlling everything, you know, the Ashkenazi elites. And Daniel himself is from the Ashkenazi elite, if anyone was ever. So, um, so I, 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 what, what would, what would it take for the movement to support uh, uh, him? Would be revamping what's already been pushed through, which is this reasonable clause, which we probably don't, we can't really get into. To Americans, it's very difficult to right. understand, but for <laughs> us, it's very important. When you, when you don't, when you can't rely on the politicians to be reasonable, you have to. Your only resort is to have the uh, the Supreme Court be reasonable. When when the government refused to f- to fund the um, the uh, hardening of buildings in the South against Hamas rockets, uh, the court said this was unreasonable. Okay, you have a budget for it, you should do it, and they forced them to do it. Okay, so so they they'd have to he'd have to do that Netanyahu. And, and he would have to entirely freeze all all legislative initiatives and enter serious discussions on a constitution. These are all big asks from him. Okay, so I think what we're getting at here, uh, coming to the end of our discussion, is you seem to be a bit skeptical that all of these kind of obstacles can be overcome. You know, simultaneously, even one, every one of them just taken by itself is is quite quite difficult. Um, in my making, is that kind of what is is that right? What I Absolutely. should I characterize yeah, your position yeah. as one of skepticism? Yeah. So, so I'll just elaborate a, a bit why why I'm skeptical. Although, as I I think I've said, or I hope I'm proven wrong. Okay, I hope I'm proven wrong because I support full normalization. Any Israeli would. Okay. But um, but I hope I'm proven wrong. But there are so many moving parts, and this is why I'm skeptical. And, and first of all, let's look inside Saudi Arabia itself, okay? The backlash from in Saudi Arabia would come more from 
full normalization with Israel than an upgraded security relationship with the United States. And that's one of the reasons why MBS has tied these two together. And we have to be careful about being carried along by this orchestrated buzz. But um, full-blown normalization, I don't think, is likely. I think it will be a slower and more partial process. The Saudis need to bring mm -hmm. along public opinion. And they're taking a page out of the UAE's playbook. They're just not as far along as the UAE. Okay? We basically haven't reached, you know, to use Americans like a football metaphor, we haven't reached the final quarter yet. Okay? Just like the UAE, UAE did, the Saudis are making Judaism as a religion more acceptable. Okay, they, they, they have to undo years of anti-Semitic education. This has included already changing their textbooks and highly publicized visits of Saudi officials to Auschwitz, where the scene of one of the uh, murders of hundreds of thousands of Jews in the Holocaust. And we've seen incremental things. They're happening every day. Israeli eSport teams have visited Riyadh. Okay, you know, eSports, I don't know how many people know that, but there's like, there's eSoccer, and these are competitions that happen online. I'm mostly younger people than me do this. But, <laughs> and uh, Mohammed bin Salman himself said, I think, in the interview, he, he's into video games, crazy into video games. Very into yeah, video games. Right. Yes. So, so just this yeah. week, two Israeli ministers visited as well as, as part of international meetings. Right, so, the tourism minister and the communications minister. Yes, I they think. visited yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and so... So what the Saudis are doing, they need to make Judaism kosher or, or halal, and then Israel. So it's a slower mm -hmm. process. Now, Saudi Arabia is a much more liberal place than it once was. Who would have thought, you know, raves in the desert, Mariah Carey, women driving. But, you know, uh, hi historians remember the 1979 takeover of the Grand, Grand Mosque. We remember 9-11, and both are protests against modernization and, and westernization. Now, normalization, full-blown normalization, okay, this is in Dubai, okay? This involves tourists. Israeli tourists can be an undisciplined crowd, all right? Just ask the Turks or the Cypriots, okay? Are the Saudis really ready to hear Hebrew spoken loudly in the cafes of Najd, okay? To have scantily clad Israeli tourists on the beach, like in Tel Aviv. Are they ready for, <clears throat> for every Israeli who wants to, to post a TikTok video of themselves holding an Israeli flag at the Prophet's, Prophet's Mosque in Medina? Okay, these are, these are a lot of things, okay? So there's a long way to go. And just um, this, uh, within the past 24 hours, there's a blogger, uh, in Saudi Arabia, a blogger, a, a influencer. His name is Muhammad Al Saud. I don't think he's related to the Saudi royal family, but he's in love with Israel. He loves Bibi. He's been here to, is, uh, uh, to Israel. He knows a bit of Hebrew. He has this huge presence. Um, he has he's gone silent in the past 24 hours. Okay, he was uh, he had published that he was going. Was he? Sp he was spit on? Was he spit He's the one who was spit like on when he visited uh, the old yeah. city and had chairs thrown at him, okay? But uh, he's, why, he, Bibi's, you know, talked to him. They, he's shown them talking to each other. Um, now, uh, you, the communications minister, uh, Shlomo uh, Karhi, uh, w was there. And this is over the Jewish holiday of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, when we build these booths outside. Um, and... Uh, Muhammad al Saud said he had built, built one as was going to invite Shlomo Karhi to come and, and visit. Um, by the way, Shlomo Karhi held uh, in his hotel well publicized uh, Sukkot services, uh, waving the palm fronds and, and all these other, other things, including showing for the first time, this is what I'm talking about, a Sefer Torah, a Torah scroll for which the mantle, the covering, says in Hebrew, Arabic, and English, or maybe just Hebrew and Arabic, dedicated to the, the, uh, by the Jewish community of Saudi Arabia. Good morning, okay, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, His Highness, His Royal Highness Salman, and his son, and so on and so forth. And this was taken pictures of. He's, he's disappeared for the fa past uh, 
24 hours. So this is why I think we're most likely to see a much slower and gradual process. And, and there's a lot of, uh, kind of a constant testing of the waters, constant um, trial balloons. And this, is, this has already begun, as, as we've discussed. And there are a lot of partial things that could be done. Um, direct flights of, of Israeli Muslim pilgrims directly to Mecca from Israel. Now they have to go through Jordan. It's very complicated. There could be interest mm -hmm. sections in embassies. There could be special business visas. There could be trade leg legations, as Israel had with Qatar at, at, at one stage. And one thing that could be done, perhaps, um, you know, we don't have time to go into it, but people know about this huge project up on the border there with uh, Egypt, uh, uh, Israel, and uh, Jordan called Neom which is practically an ex-territorial kind of place, maybe special tourist visas just for now for Israelis, which might be an easier mm. uh, swallow. So I, what I want to say is I don't, I, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't see full normalization like the Abraham Accords coming soon, but um, I'm hopeful that there can be partial steps. Now that that does make sense. It it is somewhat ironic that so much of this mooted agreement is predicated on enhanced security for Saudi Arabia, when uh, the fact of such a normalization agreement could actually um, jeopardize uh, Saudi national security in terms of uh, potential domestic backlash. Mm -hmm. So um, taking it slow, if I were the crown prince, taking it slow would be my approach. But as we know from this crown prince, he doesn't take it slow. Uh, so he's he's I mean, unexpected. There's, there's something to that. You, you know, he he, you he know. can surprise us. Um, and you know, he's creating the music of something fast. Um, but you know, uh, we'll see. And you know, he. I'm sure there are people who he's made very angry in Saudi Arabia. We don't know how much power they have. Um, there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we don't know. Um, and again, this is where we're. I feel kind of I'm skating on, on thin ice here about mm -hmm. predicting, you know. I know. One of my advisors at, at, at Princeton, who's a historian, like to say that he's, he's paid to study the past and he's not paid nearly enough to predict the future. There you go. Um, I like that. I like that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but let me say uh, Vision 2030 is this big hallmark, um, you know, national project that's been articulated and uh, promoted by MBS. But what do you think? By the end of Vision 2030, are you going to be standing in Riyadh celebrating? Uh, as an Israeli citizen. You know, so what is that? So seven years away about, you know, uh, again, uh, I'd like, I'm doubtful. I'm skeptical. It's seven years, you know, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to have for breakfast tomorrow or I, it's like so far down the road. Um, there, there's so many obstacles, even to that program itself. He, he's, he's done okay so far. He's had, he's had some stumbles. Jamal Khashoggi was a stumble. Maybe he's learned. But, you know, he's going to be around for a long time. You know, he's young and, you know, his father probably does not have long for this world. So uh, he's going to be around for a long time. And, you know, he could grow into the job and become more realistic. Um, he does seem to have support of the young people, but they're, they're not the only constituency there. Uh, so he's, you know... You know, he could could make a mistake. He's bold, you know. He's bold, but their mistakes could be made. The, the problem is we don't know enough about the people who he's angered and, more importantly, how much power and support they have. All right, final final question, Joshua, before I let you go. Um, hopefully a fun one. To, uh, let's say, since he is an Israeli citizen, I, I take it that you haven't been venturing into the, the magical kingdom too frequently. So um, what say that there is normalization by 2030, what's the first place in Saudi Arabia that you, you would want to go? Well, I think, you know, I, as you know, I, I wrote a, a dissertation and a book on, on the Hejaz, the area of Mecca and Medina. Um, so uh, non-Muslims are, are not allowed to... Uh, to visit Mecca, I would have liked to visit Mecca. I think I know an awful lot about Mecca, and 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 I think uh, you know, it used to be that non-Muslims couldn't visit Medina either. But I I don't know how for how long they they are now visiting Medina. So I I think I would like to visit uh, right. I mean, you were there recently. I, I'm probably not mistaken. Uh, I was able to go to Medina. Right. Um, 
it was I have to say it was it was awkward. The pilgrims did not like the you know, the appearance mm. of, you know, Western non Muslims mm-hmm. standing outside the Prophet's mosque. It was it was very tense. Okay. Can you imagine some it's, Israelis that, that's another obstacle. Can you imagine some Israelis in shorts and halter tops with an Israeli flag in front of the uh, the, the Prophet's mosque? Okay, so uh, um, uh, anyway, no, I think that there would need to be some restrictions. <laughs> right, on that. right. You know, I, I, we're an undisciplined crowd. You know, when we get overseas, you should just know that. You know, we like to party. So um, anyway, so yeah, so it, it would be it would be something like you know it would probably be Medina, and then uh, I think the desert, the Rubal Khali, and, and parts of Naj. You know that are. I would say very conservative, you know, where the Ikhwan comes from. I think those will kind of be the places I would, I would like to go to. You know, I'm less interested in the glitz and more interested in the in the history. As you know, we're both historians, so that kind of attracts us. Yeah, I'm not so attracted to the Formula One races in Adiria these days. Yeah, uh, yeah, really. More into the historic Wahhabism. Exactly, um, exactly. You know, and which is what you're writing on, and so well. If I can say that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. That's a plug for my, my new book. Uh, exactly. Wahhabism where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Wait, wait, show. We're, we're not on video. Movement. We're not on video. Otherwise, you know, <laughs> you could plug it. Anyway, read that book. <laughs> Wahhabism, Princeton University right. Press. All right. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> okay. Joshua, thanks for coming on the Caravan Podcast. Once again, you can read Josh's recent essay, U.S.-Saudi Relations in Crisis, History's Lessons on our Hoover website, hoover.org slash caravan. And you'll also find there a number of additional pieces on Gulf politics and Saudi-Israeli normalization. Um, by the way, if you want to learn more about Israel's constitutional crisis, uh, Josh highly recommends my Hoover colleague Peter Berkowitz's recent piece in Real Clear Politics titled Steadying Israel by Recalibrating the Separation of Powers. Uh, Please subscribe to the Caravan Podcast. We'll be back soon for a further episode. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society and improve the human condition. For more information about our work or to listen to more of our podcasts or watch our videos, please visit hoover.org.